Mr. Drew Hunter, welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing this afternoon? Doing, doing super great. Yeah, really happy to be back on. Let's start out talking about fatherhood. You had one kid last time we talked, now you're up to two. And yeah. something in the running world that people talk about is, is dad strength. Uh, it certainly looked to be that way for you this past year. Can you put some more verbiage to it? What it, it dad strength seems to be a real thing, but from a guy within it, you know, what's the what's the added boost for you? I think it's just purpose and meaning. Um, I think uh, running can be, you know, you have to have some sort of level of, I don't like to use the word selfishness, but you do need to sort of like put on the blinders to a lot of other things. And sometimes those can be, you know, you know, maybe you don't have as many, you're not going out and seeing friends as much as you'd like, or, you know, there's a certain element of your life that you're like, I'm sorry, we can't, you know, we have to say no to this thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, the real sort of like strength of dad, uh, of becoming a dad is just, you're like, oh my gosh, like I am running for something so much more than myself. And I have a family now that is relying on me. Um, and you just have a lot more love in your life. Um, you know, we were talking offline earlier, but like my daughter is just like, she's so attached to me right now. And she just wants to hug and snuggle all the time. And I'm, it's like the best feel like I get so much confidence from that like I feel like I'm it's the best version of Drew Hunter is being a dad and um and that's sort of where I feel like you know that translates to the track it's like why cannot not be confident on the track and and run personal bests and be the best runner I can be now does it work on the contrary as well where when you have a rough race or workout because workouts are more frequent you come back home and it's like your daughters have no, they don't know what a workout is. Like <laughs> they have no clue whether you had the best workout of your life or the worst one. Like they probably don't care. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny. My wife the other day was saying, um, I'm sort of going through contract negotiations, figuring out my, you know, the next stages. And we were laughing. They were like, our daughters have no idea that we're sort of like figuring out our financial situation, like big life decisions. They just want to play and be happy. And so it's a great sort of like, counterbalance to the seriousness that running can sometimes be for us it's like it's my career it's our livelihood but i come home and my daughters just want to play and snuggle and like it's it really sort of like um can bring you back to like okay this running's important but it's not everything um and it's not even you know it's certainly not more important than this and family and um all that you know comes with uh having kids and and, and you know having a relationship with your wife and um, all the, those things. So it's a really great balance to sort of, you know, remind yourself like, okay, like you love running, it's important, but it's just a part of your life and it's not everything. I know you said you want to, you know, continue chasing the dream and chopping away at this running thing, but has having two kids at this point shaped or changed your perspective on how long you want to be in the sport or has it remained pretty much the same? Yeah. Great question. I, uh, I think I, was sort of, I was open to, uh, you know, like after this contract, I was sort of wondering like, okay, where I, let's reassess, let's see, am I still loving this? Am I still, you know, am I still, you know, giving it my all? And can I train at the level that I know I have to train at to be the best I can be? That was a big thing for me. I've always sort of said like, I need to hang it up when I know I cannot, my body can't give what it needs to, to be at the level I think I, you know, want to be at. And so, I feel great. Like I, um, I feel like I almost have, uh, you know, a new wave of my running career for the next few years, um, with having kids. And I feel like for some people it might be the opposite. You're sort of like stepping away from that, but I think it's sort of given me like a resurgence of energy and excitement. And I just keep thinking in LA 2028, like my oldest will understand my running and will actually be able to be at the Olympic trials in the stadium. She was there in Eugene this year and she kind of was like, you know, dad, dad and pointing around a little bit, but she'll now be able to really sort of understand like, Oh my gosh, like dad is trying to make the Olympics and then he can, you know, represent the USA. And those things are really, really cool. And so I want to keep the dream alive, um, through, you know, through at least LA 2028. And, um, I also just think I have a ton of unfinished business. So, you know, putting, you know, the family side of things away. Like I just, I, I PR'd in every single event last year. I ran 333 in the 1500. I ran 1308 in the 5k and 2738, my first ever 10k. Um, and I finished fourth at the Olympic trials. You can't finish fourth at the Olympic trials and not go for it again, you right. know? So, um, for me, it's sort of like, I feel like I have a new runway of, uh, possibilities with running and, 
you know, I'm excited about doing longer road races and experimenting with that. And, um, there's just so much out there that's exciting and my body feels great. So those are the two things that I really think will keep me going for a while. From your response there, this is a question that uh, probably shouldn't even be asked because it's so far into the future as you're going to continue chasing after this dream. But, you know, if you got a career ending injury tomorrow or just if you think five years in the future, 10 years in the future, what are some things you're passionate about that you might potentially want to explore post running? And are those ever conversations you have with guys on the team or girls on the team now as you guys have expanded the roster of just like, you know, what do we want to do, you know? after this running thing, because you guys are so, you know, forward focused in the moment, dialed in 24 seven on, you know, how can I get sometimes tenths of a second faster to make teams? Yeah, I'm an all in person. So, uh, you know, last year I was like running and my family, that's it. Like I'm just going, you know, face down, just trucking away at those two things. Um, and I, I've always been someone that's really sort of excited about, you know, post running, what things I can do, you know, what sort of career path I can take. Um, I think there's sort of in my head, there's two things like I really want a mentor. And I know that sounds like a funny thing, but um, I was having a conversation with my brother-in-law a few days ago and, you know, he's very successful in business. And um, I just told him, I said, I moved out to Boulder. I didn't know anybody. I moved in with Reed before I even you know, met him really in person. Like I vaguely, you know, waved to him at a track meet one time. Um, And then I sort of just figured things out. I really didn't have someone telling me this is what you need to do. This is the path I took. These are the mistakes I made that I don't want you to make. Um, And I really think in whatever career I choose next, I want a mentor and I want someone that I can trust and they can trust me. And I want someone that believes in me and wants to sort of like, um, you know, take me under their wing and show me how they've done things. And I really like, I'm not picky. That could be in real estate. That could be in the running industry. That could be in a completely different career path. It could be starting my own business and just having someone that's done, you know, something in that, in that space. And, um, that's really what excites me. Um, I like feel passionate about running and I think I would love to stay in that industry if I could, um, and, you know, help athletes. Uh, I love the idea of, you know, representing athletes, helping them get sponsors. That's always been an interest of mine. I love the idea of coaching and mentoring people. That's always sort of been, you know, something I've done through Hammer and Axe Training, which is, you know, a platform we we have for Team Man Elite. So all those things excite me, but really I just would love to have a mentor and someone that um, I can spend lots of time with. Um, I love the idea of just having someone I can meet every day and talk through ideas and say, what do you think about this? And I just don't really have that in my life right now. And that would be something that I would, you know, really be interested in exploring. I have an answer for this as I have a few different mentors in different areas of my life. And so I would reiterate everything you're saying. They're life changing, but I'm curious to get in your brain on this. How would you go about finding the right mentor for you? Yeah, I, um, you can't really, you don't really go up to someone and say, Hey, can you be my mentor? I mean, (laughs) you would never, you you never go up the first time you meet, you know, a girl or a guy and say, will you be my boyfriend or girlfriend? You know, you, you develop a relation or some, you know, some, some crazy or bold people out there. Yeah. I was going to say some kid boy listening right now is definitely like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Um, but at least for me, like, I think, the way I would do it is I would find some want, some sort of industry that I'm passionate about. And then I would basically just dive into that and say, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be the first one at the office. I'm going to be the first person asking that, you know, the person I maybe want to be my mentor for more responsibility for advice. Um, but really I think it has to probably start with a relationship. Um, and I think that would just grow over time. And, uh, then, you know, I, I think trust is so important in anything that you do. And I think having someone that, you know, trusts in me, and then I can also trust in them that they want my best interest and I want their best interest. I feel like would, is the path I would take. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, this, there's so many, obviously, you know, ways to go about it, but that's sort of how I would, I would attack things. And my own personal experience, I think as human beings, we are so intrigued by one another and, we have so much bias of our own personal experience that what I found a lot of times helps or, or works or is more like if a kid reaches out to me, um, has worked in terms of like getting my attention is 
we will buy into each other's goals if we see that person put in the work to get there. So if someone reached out to me and was like, help me break 15 minutes in the 5K, complete random, making up this example. Um, and I would be like, you know, sure, why not? But the next four days, they don't run at all. You know, I don't care who you are. I'm ditching <laughs> that immediately. But, you know, if they did what I said or showed active steps towards getting there, you're then going to be bought into like, okay, what's their fitness? When's their next race? You know, what kind of shape are they in? How far away are they? And you have this personal investment. And I've heard other really successful people talk about similar things of reaching out to multi-billionaires uh, about their startup and the billionaire just gets really invested because they view their former self in their shoes and they're like, oh, is he going to make it? All this sort of stuff. So I don't know yeah. if you have any thoughts there, but I think a lot of times that's helpful. We put ourselves in their shoes and you then buy in without even really realizing it subconsciously. Yeah. No, what you just touched on was great because uh, people want to see, you know, like they want to help other people and they like having even just in my own life, people coming to me and saying like, hey, um, I know you're passionate about running. I've never really run before. What would be sort of the few first steps if I wanted to run my first 5K? I jump on those opportunities so quickly. So I also need to remind myself, wait, what if I put myself in their shoes and did it for something, someone else, you know, like if I was like, Hey, I really want to start my own business. You're someone who's done that before. Um, how can I do that? I know that people are out there that want to, you know, play that role. And so, um, I really think that's sort of, uh, something over the next few years, I'm going to be actively, you know, seeking and sort of like pursuing and, um, I also just love talking to people. So for me, um, putting myself in a position where I can, you know, have a deep relationship with someone and also like attach, you know, work to that is really, really special. So um, that's, you know, I definitely, whatever I do after running or even in running, I definitely think that's sort of would be my goal. Do you think there's a lack of mentorship within the sport of running specifically? We see in other areas, business, uh, spiritually, whatever it might be, the idea of a mentor or like, uh, I'm Catholic. Well, this is, could probably be other denominations, but like a spiritual director, right? Like a priest will be a mm -hmm. spiritual director. I feel like in running very rarely outside of a coach, is there like mentors? What's your take on that within the sport? And do you think we have a shortage of them? Yeah, I, I, I think they're probably out there. I think maybe there's not sort of a, you know, an easy, a easy way to go about, you know, I think running's changed a little bit in the last few years, but before the, the people that I said, I would, you know, love to talk to and look up to it was, they were just, they weren't accessible. Um, you know, like I remember when I first watched, you know, I have a memory of watching Olympics was 2012 and I watched Galen Rupp win a gold met, or, you know, a silver medal in the 10 K he was sort of this mysterious, you yeah, know, no one's reaching Galen. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so I think, you know, there's the people that have the potential to be mentors for people and they just have not been able to, you know, you, you just can't reach, reach out to them. And like I said, I do think that has changed with social media and the rise of sort of communication through these platforms. But um, I think that there is definitely, you know, a void. I mean, I sort of figured, I mean, like I signed a high school, a pro contract of a high school at the time, no one, no other male distance runner had ever done that. Alan Webb even went a year, you know, uh, went to college for a year and then signed his pro deal. So I didn't really have anybody that I could sort of say, what are you doing? And, you know, I remember when Hobbs was debating whether to sign a pro contract out of high school or go to college, Hobbs reached out to me and I had a phone call with him and, you know, Hobbs just got fifth at the Olympics and, he made an amazing decision and I didn't have someone that I could talk to the, through those things. And I'm so grateful that I had parents and, you know, an agent and, you know, people in my life that sort of could guide me, but I, there wasn't anyone that, you know, was in my shoes before. Um, and so for me, like that would, I had always, you know, am looking for that in, the, in my next chapter. Broadening out the conversation a little bit more, you said you want to have a conversation before the start of the podcast. This certainly will lend itself to a, a good, interesting, hot take one. Um, take sign college as someone who didn't really go to college. Uh, you can probably from a non-running perspective, what's your uh, what's your, just your opinion? I'm curious as someone who didn't go to college. Uh, yeah, I think in 2024 specifically. Yeah, I think there's certain. Uh, 
benefits of going to college that for some people make a lot of sense. If you want to be a lawyer, doctor, you know, those sort of really hardcore certification, you know, you, you, you know, med school, law school, et cetera. That is obviously a good route for someone. If you are someone who maybe doesn't love school, if you are sort of entrepreneurial thinking, you like working on your own, you like being creative, I think it's never been a better time to not pay $60,000 to an institution and get a degree. And I think like hustle and creativity and, um, you know, like you sort of were alluding to, um, just reaching out to people and making connections and finding, you know, holes in an industry that maybe needs some help with, you know, a younger, you know, someone younger or has a different, you know, view on things. Um, is great. I didn't go to college and I don't feel at all like when I'm done with my running career, um, I'm going to be, you know, you know, in trouble because I don't have a marketing degree from some jabroni university. Um, but I do think like I've got, been intentional about, um, you know, learning as much as I can, uh, you know, about whatever industry I would, you know, want to pursue something in. So I would, if I knew, you know, my running career was going to be done next year, I would be picking up every book about starting my own business and entrepreneurship, or I would be, you know, going back to school if I wanted to be a lawyer or something. So I really don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think you just have to assess your situation. Um, but it does feel like in some places, a college degree is a lot less valuable than it was a few years ago. Um, so I do, I have a, I have a good friend, uh, brother-in-law and he's getting his MBA from Notre Dame right now. And, um, he's, he's like, nothing I'm learning is anything crazy. Like, you know, it's very, like, there's some really cool professors that they, you know, cycle through that had a lot of experience. He goes, but there's also professors in my business program who have no, you know, real world experience with business. Um, and he goes, but the biggest value of this MBA is the people I'm meeting in my classes and, um, you know, the connections to other, you know, things through that. So I think if you don't go to college, you do need to find some sort of way to meet people, um, that can help you, you know, prolong your career. Um, you know, Scott Galloway has a really good book called the algebra of wealth. And he talks a lot about, yeah, he talks a lot about sort of, you know, this path. And I think, um, you know, he was just saying, like, if you're in your 20s, like, you need to, like, not be in your house. You need to be out meeting people, um, doing work for maybe not as much money as you thought you think you deserve and um, just saying yes to so many different things. And eventually, you know, that's going to pay off. It's so funny you mentioned that name because I uh, sent one of his podcasts um, to a friend yesterday and I've, like, been... I would say intently studying him over the past few months. I came across him on one of the podcasts I regularly listen to. And then I went down the deep dive and I was like, wow, this guy's got some really good stuff to say. I came across this quote, actually my mentor shared it with me. Funny enough, shout out mentors. And uh, I think, so Scott Galloway said this, I think it's great specifically in the relation to college, no college. He said, don't follow your passion, follow your talent, determine what you're good at early and commit to becoming great at it. You don't have to love it, just don't hate it. If practice takes you from good to great, the recognition and compensation you will command will make you start to love it. And ultimately, you will be able to shape your career and your uh, speciality to focus on the aspects you enjoy the most. And if not, make good enough money and then go follow your passion. I love this part. No kid dreams of being a tax accountant. However, the best tax accountants on the planet fly first class and marry people better looking than themselves, both things they are likely to be passionate about. Yeah, it's great. I actually remember that quote. Um, and uh, it's true. I mean, I mean, and I think you can tie this back to running as well. Like how many people the first time they went for a run when they were completely out of shape were like, I love this. But then they were like, wait, I'm actually good at this. And I can make a life from this. And I can get a college scholarship from this. I can um, meet amazing people through this. Um, and it may not be your passion. You may be passionate about something that's completely different, but doesn't make sense to sort of pursue a career in. So, um, no, I, I, like, I think there's something to be said. And, um, people always ask like, how did you catch the running bug? And it was like, it's so, it was so obvious to me. It was like, I was good at it. And then everything else followed from there. Like I just got so invested into that because I was good at it and I got recognition and you know I 
like so many more doors open because of that. And uh, it's true. Like, you know, like I was passionate about, like I was obsessed with baseball growing up, obsessed. Like I had the card collection. I didn't miss a single Cleveland Guardians game or Indians at the time. Um, I'll probably get canceled for that, but whatever. Um, uh, and I, but I was never going to be an MLB baseball player. So that would be a stupid thing to follow. That was my passion, but my, what was my talent? I can run really, you know, fast for a long time. And so, um, no, I think it's very good sentiment and, uh, it's what I would probably, you know, want anyone struggling with, you know, figuring out their why and what they want to do. It's just like, what are you good at? You know, dive into that. We're down 2 L. What needs to change to flip the series around? If you're following baseball oh, man. these days. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, They've, le- they've left a lot of guys on base in the last two games, so we definitely need to hit. Uh, Jose Ramirez needs to, you know, he's had not a great playoffs, and he's the best player on our team. So I think, uh, you know, if he steps up. But, um, yeah, like we, we we definitely need to. I mean, I think the bases loaded were twice. The bases were loaded twice last game, and we didn't capitalize on either of those, and that's the loss right there. So, um, yeah, we definitely just got to score more runs and offenses proving to be really, really important in the, in these last, in this series. You mentioned a guy like Scott Galloway for your future kids, whenever they come of age, maybe like around high school age off the top of your head, who are like three names or, or three resources that you'd, you'd like try slotting under the table. Like, Hey, read this book, listen to this podcast with this person. Yeah. Um, great question. Uh, the first book is about money psychology of money by Morgan Housel. Um, Dude, we read the same stuff. I swear everyone everyone needs to read that it's just the most basic simple methodical guide on how to build wealth and um it's uh the the advice from that is basically just don't make big mistakes uh do not do anything stupid for 40 years and you can be wealthy and you can set yourself up for a life you want and um i think that's sort of awesome advice um I, if a spiritual book would probably be something like mere Christianity by CS Lewis, that's sort of a basic intro to Christianity, you know, uh, very, very powerful. Um, and then I, I think another book that was really life changing for me is blue ocean, a book called blue ocean strategy. Um, it's a book about how to stand out in a crowded marketplace. Um, and it's a business book and it was very sort of enlightening for me with, um, ideas for Tim and elite and hammer and ax training and, um, sort of, you know, just, you know, a lot of times people copy other people in the industry they're in and they say, Oh my gosh, this company was successful. We just have to do what they're doing. And in reality, you should be looking for a blue ocean, an opportunity of, something that's never been done before in that industry. And I think that the running space has so many opportunities for things like this. And um, it's sort of always just, it was a really good book and something that, um, you know, if my kids had any sort of entrepreneurial um, spirit, I would definitely want to want them to read that. Speaking of Tin Man Elite, as well as Hammer and X training, what's the vision with them? And as much as you're willing slash able to share as you're going through contract renegotiations, how does that how does that work in terms of you know there's Drew Hunter and then there are these kind of brands that you are the like co-founder of. How how does all of that mesh and interact with one another? Yeah, it's it's definitely complicated and and sort of uh, messy. So I mean, Team Man Elite is an elite running team, and our goal has always been to push the sport of running forward on and off the track. Um, we do that through elite performance. We do that through you know, creating the best storytelling content we can around people on the team. Um, And then, you know, sort of the biggest, you know, ad recently has been um, community and our summer, you know, we have a, we have a summer camp now and that's sort of our, um, you know, our foundation of what we do and how we're successful. Um, And then Hammer and Axe training is just coaching, mentorship. Um, You know, we can, you can hire one-on-one coaches, you can buy a turkey trot plan, you can buy a Chicago marathon plan. And they're all written by, you know, very, very good, um, great coaches that have, you know, put a lot of thought into training. And, you know, that's sort of we would love, like, you know, I really want to dive into, you know, helping people who've never run before, take the first few steps. I think there's not a lot of great help out there for people who've never run. And I think that there's sort of, you know, 
um, a blue ocean, if we want to go back to that, um, <laughs> you know, that reference uh, of, you know, opportunity for just, what do I do? I want to get in shape. I want to run a marathon one day, but I've never really been a runner. I've never really done running as exercise and hammer and axe is where you can find a coach, get some mentorship, get some guidance on that. Um, as well as we just love to put out educational content, um, fueling for marathons, you know, um, what shoes we're wearing, just any, anything, um, running related. Um, and then there's me, I have my own running contract, um, and I am trying to run as fast as I possibly can, um, and make world championships, Olympic teams. And they all go together because they're all sort of tied to changing the sport for the better. Um, you know, personally, like I want to run fast because that inspires people. And, you know, that's something that I've always wanted to do is run at the highest level. I want to represent the U S and the Olympics and world championships. And Tim man elite is sort of the team around me to help me do that. Um, and also help other athletes who want to, you know, try to do the same thing. Um, so yeah, it all, it, it's all crazy. And right now, like you were, you know, alluding to my contracts up, the team's contract is up contract is up so we're sort of figuring out what we want to do next and what that looks like and um it's stressful and it's scary but it's also like pretty exciting um and you know there's a lot of opportunities for us and we really want to sort of you know make the right decision for the team and we want to make the right decision for you know myself and my family and um so i've just been you know uh sort of taking these next few weeks to figure all that out because uh 2025 is gonna be here pretty soon I'm fascinated to talk about and hear about this side of you that reads psychology of money, knows who Scott Galloway is, these people, because the average guest on the podcast, if I brought up Scott Galloway, they'd be like, who, what? Like mm -hmm. people within the sport of running are very singularly focused. I think a lot of times that's for good. I think on the contrary, a lot of times they could expand their scope and it could help them in all the other areas of life. Where did you even come across these names? Are are you like in the business? This is clearly a business side of you because these are business people. Um, is this coming from your parents at an early age, like forming you in that way? Or is this more of a recent pursuit? Because even though there are examples that you could apply directly into running, this is like anyone who's read these books knows what I'm talking about. These are not, this is not <laughs> the science of running by Steve Magnus. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, I just, I, I love to read. I, I try to always have a book, um, on hand right now. I'm, um, you know, reading, uh, um, another, another sort of business book. Um, it's called only the paranoid survive. It's by, uh, um, the former Intel CEO about basically looking at the holes in your company and how to like, make sure that you don't, those don't ruin your company. And, um, I think it's weird with, uh, a lot of these sort of, you know, Morgan Housel books and Scott Galloway books is one of the reasons I, you know, do enjoy them is I like, I'm not, I would love to start my own business. I have, you know, Hammer and Axe coaching and Tim and Elite and those are sort of businesses, but I just am, a, I love learning and I love, um, I just love the, I, like, I just, you know, there's so many people out there who knew so much more than me. And if I don't take advantage of that while I'm young, yeah, I, like I'm just wasting away, you know, the years that I could be, um, you know, just learning things. And so, um, I don't even honestly know how I came across these people. I think like it was a sort of like a simple, I probably bought, I don't even remember what my first book was. I think I actually, the first book I ever read was a rich, rich dad, poor dad. And I read that and I was like, Oh, okay. This is making me potentially think about money a little bit differently. And, um, you know, wealth and, um, when I had it, my first kid, I really started to get into this stuff because I, you know, it wasn't about me anymore. And I, like, I'm obsessed with the idea of leaving my family better off than, you know, I was. And I, I just really, I, I, I like love that sort of wealth creation idea. And, um, you know, it's a pers pursuit of mine for the rest of my life. And, um, so I think that's sort of where I, you know, got the inspiration to read these books, but then you read one and, you know, you sort of go, Oh, like, I want a little bit more of that, you know, it could be, you know, um, and, and then you sort of just go down these deep dives. And like, also, there's so many great, um, like recommended reading lists. I mean, it's so easy, you can, you know, go on Google or go on chat GPT and say, these are my interests. I've done this before. Like I've said, I want a book that talks about psychology, money, finance, business, and 
is written by someone, you know, who in the last 20 years, and you can just type that into chat GPT and it'll give you five books. And I normally will just order all of them and slowly work through them. Um, and, uh, that's something I've just, you know, done recently, uh, like in the last, you know, two or three years, like I try to read as much as I can. It's a little harder well, not, yeah. now because I have kids, but every night I try to at least, you know, read a few pages of whatever book I'm, 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 you know, I'm consuming at the time. You're probably reading a lot of books, just the ones where the pages are super thick and they're cardboard and they're to your daughters. <laughs> yes. Like I minutes. do read lots of, uh, um, you know, baby books and that actually turns your brain to mush, I swear, but they love it. So <laughs> what's an idea you've come across within one of these books or a podcast recently that you've been chewing on or stretch your thinking? You didn't ever think of the concept before coming across it. Yeah. Um, Another great question. I uh, read a book in the last, I can't remember how long ago I read it, um, but it's called Poor Charlie's Almanac. It's Charlie Munger's sort of like his talks he gave at, at lecture. Let me back up a little bit. Charlie Munger is Warren Buffett's sort of right-hand man, and he helped fund, you know, found Berkshire Hathaway and helped, you know, turn it into, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world. And um Charlie Munger was always kind of sort of like obsessed with psychology and how humans worked and how humans thought and how, and he, how he could, you know, apply that to business. And one of his sort of mental, you know, strategies he would always use is inverting problems. And that was a really cool thing for me to think about. So instead of, you know, I'll tie it back to running. So instead of saying, what's the best training plan I can create for myself for this, you know, race coming up, you would say, what are the biggest mistakes I could possibly make? And let me avoid those. I'm going to create a training plan where I don't get injured. I don't get sick. I don't get burnt out. And he would invert everything. Um, and I think like that's something I've sort of started to do a little bit in my day-to-day -day life, um, especially with decisions. You know, like I have a lot of important decisions in the next few months. And um, I sort of want to tackle them in a way where I say, okay, what – are the big mistakes I could make. Let's try to avoid those. And by avoiding those, I think we'll do our best job making a good decision. Um, and it's just a little bit of a sort of like a psychology trick you can do. And, um, but I think runners could actually do it. I mean, how many people create an amazing training plan and then four weeks in they're injured. And so it's like, who cares how good the training plan was versus if you had sort of started with, I'm not going to get hurt. I'm just going to create a plan where I know I can sustain you know, this for eight weeks, I know that I'll, maybe it's only running three times a week. Maybe it's only running five times a week, but I know I'll be able to get out the door every day. Um, by the end of that, you're going to have a great outcome. And so for me, that is something I'm sort of thinking a lot more about. Um, it's just inverting things a lot, uh, like uh, more in life and, and running. We've been talking about business and money. So I'm going to go back to something you discussed earlier, which was Hobbs reaching out to you at the time of signing his contract coming out of high school, Drew, something that was, you were way, you know, before my time, NAL, you didn't even probably, I'd bet money, you'd never even heard that word. That word probably didn't exist if you looked it up in a dictionary. Do you ever, uh, resentment's probably not the right word because no one's ever going to say yes to a question that has resentment in it. But uh, do you ever uh, daydream about what kind of deal you could have gotten back in the day in high school with one of these companies? Uh, I don't think too much about it, to be honest. I think it's cool that, you know, they have that now. I mean, I live five minutes from Niwot High School. You know, there are kids on that team that have great NIL deals, and that is really cool. Um, I'm all about, you know, getting paid what you're worth and getting paid, you know, the value that you provide for a shoe company or, you know, a protein sponsor or whatever it may be. Um, I think it's a really cool landscape, and I, uh, I see – a lot of value in high school and college kids, sometimes even more than professional athletes. Um, they're, you know, relatable. They can sort of be themselves. They don't have to have this sort of, you know, you know, polished image of, Oh, I can't say this. I can say that. Like they're just kids. And I think there's something authentic about that. And um, if I was a brand, I would be pouring, you know, lots of money into the kids that I really thought could represent my brand. Well, I'm, Koros is one of our sponsors for Tim and Elite, and they do a lot of NIL stuff. And I've done, you know, some calls with the kids on the programs. And these are the best kids. Like, 
they care about running so much and all they want to do is get better and they want to help their teammates get better and they want to better their program. Um, and they're all going to like Stanford and Harvard, like they're the smartest kids. And it's like, why would I not want to invest in someone like this? You know, they're awesome kids. And so I think there's sort of, you know, a really cool landscape um, with the NLI stuff. And even though I didn't get to benefit from it, that's okay. Like I'm, you know, I'm still youngish. Like I just turned 27 and um, I, I, you know, I, I really think it's, it's, it's cool. And I hope that they sort of continue to pour money into the, into those sort of programs. Another thing that probably wasn't as around, I was nine, 10 years ago, so I wouldn't really know, but I doubt social media was that much of a thing uh, when you were in high school. That's another element that has kind of risen with the rise of NIL and just kids and rankings. And, you know, if you go on a top kid in the country's Instagram feed, it's going to be every other top kid on the feed and every ranking, do you feel like the lack of social media or correct me if I'm wrong, if social media was a big thing back then kind of helped you to have a more sustainable, healthy outlook on the sport as you were coming up within it? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some damaging sides to social media and especially for young people. Um, you know, um, there's another good book for any parent out there they need to read called the anxious generation by Jonathan Haidt. It's terrifying when you sort of read it, uh, as a parent, you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm, never going to give my kids a phone. They're never going to go on the internet. And obviously you need to, you know, you know, wind back a little bit and say, okay, that's ridiculous. But it does give sort of good outlines for when you should give your kid a phone and when they should have access to the internet. But yeah, I do think it's hard. I mean, you're constantly being compared to not just, I mean, it used to be you compared to kids in your, on your team, and then it was a district and then it was a region and then it was the state. And now it's like, oh my gosh, there's, a 17 year old kid in Kenya who just ran, you know, 143 for the 800. Like, what am I doing with my life? And I don't think that's a healthy approach for young kids. But um, I also think that if you sort of take the, you know, process approach and say, well, I'm going to do everything every day to get better. I'm going to do everything every day to have a healthy relationship with running and not sort of put too much pressure on myself. You know, you can, um, you can navigate those things and you can eventually, you know, reach the goals that you want and you can eventually be really happy with the running career you have, even if there are people faster than you. Um, so uh, I just think there needs to be conversations around that. And I hope that people that are struggling with that have someone in their life that they can talk to and, um, you know, say like, Hey, it's okay. Like, are you doing your best? And that's all that matters. A lot of top kids, both in high school and the NCAA listen to this podcast regularly. So I'm curious to pick your brain on the subject of if you're on social media and you're a fast kid, you're going to get hate from someone. Inevitably, it just happens as someone who's, you know, undergone your own uh, pursuits in the sport and gotten lashback or, you know, whatever dumb comments come up on social media, what would be some advice for blocking that outside noise out from people who, you know, you've most likely never met or even know who they are? Yeah. I used to care so much about, that stuff and a flip a switch just flipped as soon as i became a parent i don't care at all um i'm not even sure how or why i mean i've gotten some pretty insane dms over the years i've had people you know like saying awful things about me on you know let's run in my comments and things like that and it doesn't happen as much anymore um but i just don't care anymore and i think like um something I remind myself is I've never had a bad interaction with anybody in person ever. And so my advice to people out there is a, the person behind the board is insecure. They have something maybe in their own life that they're struggling with. And that's why they're saying something rude or mean about you. Um, and so like taking the human element into it, it's like, I feel sorry for them. Like I know that they're going through something and, um, I wish that they hadn't had that happen. It could even be back, you know, from their childhood. Um, like, and then B, I just remind, like, I would say, like, if you're not having those in person, there's a reason for that. Those are the real connections. And those are the real relationships that you're going to have are the people that you, you know, can give a hug to and the people that you can give, share good news with. And um, those are the relationships that matter. And so these people on the internet, like they will say things and you sort of just have to, you know, um, not let it get to you. And if it does get to you, don't let yourself see it. Um, that's sort of my 
C solution if you're like, ah, this stuff bothers me because it did used to bother me. Um, just don't let yourself see it, uh, you know, and, and that's totally okay too. Um, I think, uh, you know, I would also recommend talking with sports psych. That's why they're there. They can really help you navigate sort of that, um, you know, the expectations, failures and setbacks, but also just dealing with people that are just going to be nasty. So um, I, I would definitely recommend, you know, you know, seeking professional help if you really want um, to sort of under, unravel and understand why people do that and then, you know, what you can do about it. I've quoted this a few times on podcasts throughout the years, I think twice, but I did it like two weeks ago. So people may have heard it before, but it's quoting Christian Bale. And he said, um, if you have a problem with me, call me. And if you don't have my number, you shouldn't have a problem with me. I think it's good. It's the nail yeah, that. no, it's good. I, yeah. I've tried to be better about this recently. Sometimes even just like amongst my own relationships, I'm like, stewing on something or maybe i just need to talk things something through and i feel like the best solution is just to tell that person like hey like what you said was hurtful or you know that you know like uh you know hey i don't know if this is just a miscommunication or something happened here but i um can we talk this through and and that's been huge and like you know you're saying like i don't think i've ever received something like a mean comment or a mean message from someone that I actually knew. Um, cause it just doesn't happen, you know? And if it does, um, then you've probably done something really bad. <laughs> I'm totally going to butcher this quote cause I couldn't find it on my phone and <clears throat> it'll be completely off the top of my head. I think it was from Alex Formosi. If you know that name, I feel like you would studying mm-hmm. business. He said something to the extent of like the life you want is on the other side of a few hard conversations and the reason Mm -hmm. like you aren't satisfied with your life right now is because you're afraid to have them i think it's true he has another thing that he talks about of like you know you're not stressed you just have decisions you need to make and i think those things eat at us you mentioned it you know when you build that up in your head of you know this person did x y or z it's like just go talk to him (laughs) like yeah it'll eat at you more totally yeah no it's 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 uh it's you know very good it's good marriage advice. Like if there's something like you don't go to bed angry, like don't go to bed, you know, like if there's something on your guys' minds and that something you need to address, like talk it out and just, um, you know, come at it with grace and love and, you know, intention to resolve the conflict or, you know, get to like, what is, you know, what's upsetting each other. Um, but yeah, just, just talk and just communicate. You mentioned how you've overcome this since having kids, the, thought of you know caring about what other people think or what other people say throughout the past 10 years of a professional running career what are some of the biggest ways you feel like you've grown in those 10 years from year one compared to year 10 uh yeah i think balance is one um i was obsessed with running um when i first saw my pro deal like unhealth in an unhealthy way like it was just everything for me um and i think that didn't help with uh you know, when someone said something mean about me, it was like, oh my gosh, you were like just tearing down everything for me. And and I think having kids has just been like, oh wait, there is so much more. And like, my kids love me, my wife loves me and I'm, you know, providing for them and I get to, you know, help nurture them along in their own life. And that's so much more meaningful. So I think that's one thing that I feel like 18 year old Drew just really needed to have someone say to him, like, dude, like, you know, I call it the eat the cookie advice. Like I used to be so stressed about like what I could eat and what I couldn't eat. And it was just like, maybe you just eat a cookie and say, and be kind and gracious to yourself and say, it's not going to affect your performance or it's not going to make you a bad runner. Um, and it's so ridiculous to even say that out loud now that that was sort of a thought process, but you know, we get obsessed with things and we get sort of, you know, we go down this, I, this rabbit hole idea that, you know, to be the best athlete, I need to, you know, do everything perfectly for, you know, 15, 20 years. And that's just not how humans are. And, um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's just something as I just feel like running isn't everything anymore. You mentioned very early on in our conversation, your 2024 season PRing at almost every dist, or I think basically every distance Mm -hmm. placing fourth at the Olympic trials. What did this year teach you about what you can do in this sport? And how does that match up with, I'm sure, wide-eyed Drew coming out of high school on top of the world? Yeah, I mean, this year, I I came into the year after one of my worst years yet. Um, Not just even 
you know, I didn't, it was like the first year I hadn't set a personal record and, um, didn't have a good USA championships. Um, I, and I ended my season running a 342 1500, which was what I ran in high school. Like it was bad. And I started the year with no confidence, no belief in myself. And, um, I sort of looked at this year as like my victory lap. I was like, I'm not going to get re-signed. I'm, you know, I'm, my running career is going to be done. Uh, I got to figure out what I'm doing next. I have a kid and another on the way. It was kind of like, oh man, like all these different sort of things. And I just really had to almost sort of start from ground zero. Um, And so I started uh, like, really a really simple morning routine where I basically just go down in my basement and it sounds ridiculous. I go down in my basement and I'd walk backwards on my treadmill and I would use Hallow. It's a Catholic prayer app. And I would just do that every day to start my day. And I, for whatever reason, this maybe wouldn't work for everybody, but I just was able to sift through everything. And I was able to just really, really sort of like address all of the issues I was having with running and in, you know, my personal life and, Um, my relationship with running and um, I was able to really just sort of like deep dive into you know what was I doing like what was my purpose what am I you know why am I doing this and through those quiet moments with myself and in prayer and meditation I was able to really sort of um, foster a new love for the sport and foster sort of like confidence in myself like I did not believe in myself at the start of this year and by the end and you know when I was at the Olympic trials like I thought I could make the Olympic team. Like I thought I could run with Grant Fisher and Nico Young and Woody Kincaid and nothing on paper indicated that I could do that, but I believed I could. And I was, you know, right next to Nico Young was 60 meters to go um, in the 10 K final. And he ended up getting, I don't know what eighth or ninth in the Olympics and ran 26 50, you know, it's like, he's an amazing runner. And um, I had no business being there, but I figured it out up here. And, um, that was huge. And that was sort of like what I needed to do. And now I feel like I, you know, I kind of said at the start of the podcast, I feel like I almost have a, um, a newfound appreciation for the sport and love for, you know, just that I was able to conquer my mind. Um, and ironically enough, I had sort of some like weird lingering back issues and injuries and through sort of figuring things out up here, a lot of my injuries sort of went away and it just shows how much the mind and body are connected. Um, and like, uh, I was able to really, um, you know, just become a different runner and different person. Like I was happy and confident and, um, a lot more fun to be around. I'm sure my teammates can attest. And, uh, and it was just, you know, I, I just fell in love with the process again. I felt like a kid, like I really did. Like I'd show up to races and I was like, this is fun. This is like, this is what you've been training for. This is the opportunity right here. For 2025, we're, you know, two, three months out from it. It's ridiculous. We're in October. It's like, feels weird. Time just flies by so fast. I'm sure you feel Mm -hmm. like that now that you have two kids. It's like wild, wild how fast time goes by. What would you consider success to be in 2025? If we were to talk a year from now, what would you consider to be a successful year? Um, having this conversation with you and I still have a good relationship with running a year from now. So maybe we can book it for a year, uh, another podcast a year from now. Um, yeah, really, I, I, I'm really under the belief now at this point in my running career that, um, if I'm happy, if I'm content, if I'm fulfilled in what I'm doing and I have purpose, I just think the sky's the limit and I think I can just keep getting better. So I don't really have like a time goal or, I don't have like, you know, I want to finish top five at USA's or anything like that. I really just think if I am ticking all those boxes, then I'm going to have a good running career. If the next five years is a chapter in your life, what's this current chapter about? The next five years. Next five years of Drew Hunter's life. What's this current Uh, chapter about? um, I would say it's about like becoming a father and then, um, while also navigating my career and sort of um, nurturing both of those things. I'd say that's what it would be about. Nurturing sort of the, you know, potentially the last part of my running career and then saying bye to that. And then, you know, raising children for the first time and bringing them into the real world. Um, You know, they're still babies right now. They can't even talk. Um, So I'd say just nurturing both of those things. Drew, closing out this conversation, I wanted to bring this up with you. I'm doing a 
podcast series leading into Foot Locker this year. I did it last year as well. You're the king of Foot Locker. You, you <laughs> aced it in high school. And I'm curious to hear about, do you ever reminisce? Maybe this is just me because I'm like fresher out of high school. But a lot of times I think back to those days. I'm like, man, like just like random stuff with teammates that I didn't appreciate in the moment. Now in hindsight, I'm like, man, I wish I would have appreciated that moment. Or you think to like a random race course that you'll probably never go to again. And you have a memory of that X, Y, and Z. Take me back to those high school days. Do you ever miss them? Any fun memories? Basically just going back in time. What's the nostalgia when you think of the, the high school days of Drew Hunter? Yeah, I think, you know, a photo will pop up. Um, or something, you know, like I, I'm still good buddies with some of the guys on the team that I ran with in high school. I mean, I, you know, was just on the phone with one of my best friends and he ran with me in high school um, the other day in the car. And I, I, I think there's, you know, like you just said, like when you're in high school, you don't realize how amazing those times are. And so you just need to constantly remind yourself, like, this is, this is the only moment I have the future, you know, the, the, the past is you know, it's gone. And then the future isn't reality. You're not there yet. You don't know what's going to happen. So like just reminding yourself to be present with your teammates and with those moments and even like the scary moments of like right before the gun goes off and the nerves are high, like it's, that's, that's the best stuff. Um, and then, but I also tell people like, oh my gosh, life is so beautiful. Like I feel so like, I feel that more now more than ever. I mean, like it's, like fall right now and like I have two kids and like our house is cozy and I'm like this is the best like I just have so much love in my life um and that's so special and so like every stage and every chapter of your life can be amazing um and you know I think like finding you know I I, I like gratitude is so powerful anything is just you know you can overcome anything with gratitude I just saying like I'm so grateful that I have a hot meal or I'm so grateful that I have someone to, you know, share a meal with. Um, and it could be the crappiest meal ever, but you're just, you know, you're, you're choosing to see what you can be grateful for. And, um, I feel like I'm trying to, you know, propel that into my, the next part of my running career. Um, but yeah, like, uh, just going back to the high school thing, like at that time, that was the best moment of my running career when I won Foot Locker. And I've had so many other moments after that, that have been the best moments of my running career. And so, things just build and um, there's always something to be looking forward to. And um, I would tell that to any high school kid and um, yeah. Cool. Reframing a phrase I heard a few months ago, some of the best days of your life haven't happened yet. And it's it's definitely true for every single person out there. And there's some hope in that if you're going through a tough time, Drew, final question for you. Um, You will have to put me onto the brand because I'm forgetting the brand's name. We can do some, some free promotion here and make the company happy. I know you've done some, uh, promotion for like a stroller company. It helps now that you're a, you're a dad, perfect brand integration there talking business. Mm -hmm. What is a, um, what's a, a dad collaboration could be within running, could be outside of running. Uh, that's not completely far-fetched and out of reality, but also a a little far-fetched and you'd like to see come to life, like a brand you love in relation to dad running, whatever it might be that you, you want. The executives are listening. Pitch us. Yeah. I love it. Um, I think the one you just mentioned is, you know, I'm, I'm actually working on a contract with Tule, which is the, uh, the brand that you were talking about is a stroller brand. Like they make strollers, they make car seats, they make, um, rooftop things. Uh, you know, they even make rooftop tents for families and it's so cool. It's so pro family. And like, it's just like, they just, everything they make is a product for families. And I like love that. And obviously a stroller is perfect because it's family, it's running, it's sort of everything I love. Um, one of my dreams would be to be like a partnered with an Airbnb or something like that. I'm like one of the few people that enjoys traveling with Airbnb for races and meets. And that's because I can bring my family along. Um, so, you know, that's sort of where I think that would be a really cool partnership. And, um, some of the places we get to go are beautiful. I mean, just like even, you know, going to like any races in Europe, like there's so many beautiful Airbnbs that you can stay in in these cool countries. And I really think that we could provide a lot of value in, um, you know, creating content around that or showcasing, you know, special Airbnbs or, you know, what are the best Airbnbs for, you know, certain meets. I mean, we're in Eugene every single year. It's like, there's gotta be some awesome Airbnbs there that we could really make cool and famous. And 
um that would be a really cool collaboration i've always dreamed of being you know partnered with airbnb um i've actually even tried to go down that rabbit hole to get a connection and everything and i've given up because i've tried so much with it but um maybe there's someone out there listening that works for the company and i have some great ideas if you want to if you want to uh, uh hit me up we can we can chat Amazing. Amazing. Do always love my conversations with you. Always learn so much, but more importantly, I always walk out of them like high on life. Uh, you bring such a joyful wisdom and presence to each conversation and I'm so appreciative of it. So keep crushing it. And yeah, we'll talk next October and answer that question. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dominic. It was great to be on again.